Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. We have a special guest with us here today. This is Ron Feemster, better known as Nephew. Well, hello. How y'all doing? It's great to see you. Thanks for coming in today. Yeah, it's good to be seen. It's yeah, good man. to be here. So you're here on behalf of Apogee? Yes. You guys have some cool stuff going in the studio that I want to talk a little bit about. But, uh, man, I have to tell you, I was kind of looking back through your career and your uh, your progress through the industry. And you've, you've just had an amazing couple of decades here, right, of, of really great success. Super grateful, man. I just, you know, I feel like my heart took me places that my talent couldn't take me. Uh, I don't know, man. Talent is right up there. It's got to be. I'm glad I have both. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, it uh, I, is, is it true, drums and piano at age of two? Yeah, I started. Yeah, is that yeah, right? I is started, it? yep. So at two years old, what were you doing? What, what attracted you to the instruments? Oh, well, my father and mom, I'm a PK, preacher's mm -hmm. kid, so I grew up in church. And the kind of church that I grew up in, it wasn't a religious church. It was more of a, a love relationship, you know, and uh -huh. it taught me how to basically hear from heaven and score people's hearts mm -hmm. and be sensitive to how people feel and... And I put that with chords and different sounds, and it's like a movie. You start scoring a movie, and if you score it right, the words that come next, you can just intercept really nicely. So. Right, right. Did you start at uh, an early age like that with the composing and the songwriting side of it as well, or were you mainly focusing on learning to play? You no, know, it, was, it was learning feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I felt my way through everything. And... Uh, when you felt good, you played a certain way. When you played sensitive, you felt a certain way. When you felt aggressive, you played a certain way. Mm -hmm. And um, I just learned how to have a good ear. I, I learned how to hear. And, and my dad and my mom plays as well. And my uncles and aunts, they all play instruments. So I kind of grew up in it. And right. uh, I saw how they expressed themselves. And, and it was freedom. So they gave me the opportunity to freely express myself with sound. All right, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So you went from, this is in North Carolina, correct? Mm -hmm. And you went from there to Berkeley in Boston. What led you to pursue the, the educational side of things? Well, you know, first, I, you know, I was, I was looking at these other colleges in North Carolina, and then my cousin told me that there was a college in Boston where you really didn't, you didn't need to take too many education courses, that it was all music mostly. <laughs> right. and you can get a degree, and I was like, that sounds like my kind of school. Right. Where I can just focus on our music and I'd apply for a scholarship there and um and they wanted me to fly up and they wanted to meet me. So me and my dad flew up to Boston for our first time and and my audition actually turned into a jam session. And um my teacher at the time, his name was John Carroll. Mm -hmm. And he was like, You're good and I remember walking outside those doors and my dad and his eyes we kinda both knew what it was. Right. And fast forward, I remember I was in high school and they called my name. They wanted me to come to the office. And I was like, come to the office. So as I was coming down the hallway, I saw both of my parents with the piece of paper that said I've been accepted. And so, yeah. Oh, how awesome. So Berkeley was a pretty amazing experience. Right, right. And what did you take away from that experience? How did, how did that build on what you had uh, learned at home and, and in church? I learned, again, from people. Uh, my best education was the friends that I was around. I was around different kinds of people, different cultures, different beliefs, different everything, and they all brought their originality to the table. So I got to eat from many different musical restaurants and be inspired, you know, seeing amazing players from all over the world. So I'm, I learned more outside of the classroom more than I did in the classroom. My apologies, Berkeley, you know. Uh, <laughs> but when, you, when you're around all of that talent and different kinds of people is just it's addicting it's a it's attractive you know all those different flavors and colors and right yeah right and uh, if i understand the story correctly that led to your first break which was writing a song in your dorm room that somehow made its way to to will smith and men in black too right man you know your stuff well, you, you know, know your stuff. Like what we're talking about <laughs> uh it's, it's it was a cool story it was the moment where I actually didn't know what a producer was going to college. I thought the biggest thing you could be in music at that time was just, you know, playing behind some Christian band or some gospel band. But, you know, I've always, since maybe seven or eight, I was always making beats on my uncle's keyboards because they had like the latest and greatest keyboards. Mm -hmm. So one day this guy named Jamie walked into my dorm room, 150 Mass Ave, and he said, what do I want to do with the next five years of my life? And I thought about it, because I wanted to be a film composer. That's like my heart. 
But when I first got to Berkeley, those computer labs were so intimidating. So right. I decided to take up the class of learning from my friends. And uh, joke, you know, I joke. Right. Right. Anyway, uh, he walked in my room and I was like, he's like, what do I like doing best? I was like, I like putting things together. And he's like, that's called producing. He's like, people actually have careers. I was like, they do? So next thing you know, he started playing me different CDs and I was like, that's what I like to do. And I was like, I want to be a producer. And I called my parents and I said, I want to drop out. I know what I want to do. I want to pursue my life. My parents were like, hold up. <laughs> and it was like, if you still feel the same way, we're going to call you mm -hmm. um, next week. And if you still feel the same way, we're going to fly out there and lick you in your eyes. And um, so I always made this same rock beat over and over on my, at the time it was the Korg. It was a Triton mm -hmm. keyboard. And I was make the same beat over and over and over. And, so they called me next week, and I was like, I still feel the same way. And my parents flew out, they looked me in my eyes, and it was like, okay, we don't ever want to be the parents that we held you back, and we believe in you. And next thing you know, I stopped going to classes, I stayed in my dorm room, and I just started perfecting, making beats, because I knew what I wanted to do with my life. Right, right. And um, I got a friend who called me, he was already in California at the time, he was like, I have a job out here with you with the landed records if you want it. And um, I said, California, you know, from North Carolina, you know, California is like, only thing I knew about California was like Moesha and maybe 9021 though, cause you know. Right, right. And so my parents gave me $500, suitcase, an amp and a keyboard. And that stretched me for a good 20 years now. Nice. And um. And that demo tape got in Will Smith's hands. Mm -hmm. And I got a call and it was like, Will want this to be his theme song for Men in Black 2. And I was like, huh. I was like, okay. I didn't know how big of a deal it was until I started looking at Burger King commercials and they start playing my song. And <laughs> then I start seeing in different areas and, and radio and I was like, oh, this is serious. And, but yeah, that's the right. intro. That's very cool. What a great way to launch yourself to California and into yeah. your career and get it all the way since then, of course. Eminem and Dr. Dre and Michael Jackson and the list goes on and on and on of all these incredible people that you've worked with and, and on producing and, and musical things for. Tell us a little bit about how that works. How do you connect with those people? I mean, you obviously had that credit of Men in Black too, but you still have to get yourself in touch with these people or they get in touch with you. And how did that work in your case? Um, well, with Dr. Dre, um, some guys from Boston that I knew in Boston, um, they were taking a trip up to California. And by the summer, I was already out in California and I was touring with the lady named Sunshine Anderson who has been managed by Macy Gray at the time. Mm -hmm. And I knew Macy Gray because I met her in New York when I was in college. So Macy saw me and Macy was like, uh, hey, the musical director didn't show up. Do you want to be the musical director? And I was like, oh. I was like, yeah, right? So long story short, that happened, I went on tour and and the guys came and they was like, hey, we have some of your beats. You mind if we play them for this guy named Dr. Dre? And me growing up in church, I wasn't really familiar, mm -hmm. you know, with a lot of the other music. And I was like, yeah, you know. So uh, clearly the meeting went really well. Right. And so Dre was, he wanted to contact me and connect with me and, and we met. And then when we met, it was just like a match made in heaven. Mm -hmm. um, I played for him and and next thing you know I'm on a plane to I think Reno, Nevada and Eminem is right here Dr. J is right here and everybody's looking at me <laughs> and I'm like man what is happening right now and, <laughs> and this guy named Melman comes out the back and he was like hey if you don't play Somebody else will. Hmm. I was like, oh. So then I went, and that's when the song Let's Get Down to Business was born. And then from there, our relationship just, just soared. And until today, Dre is still a good friend, a mentor. All right. More like a bigger brother to me. That's awesome. And, um, yeah. That's awesome. So when you when you have the idea for, for the beats and the productions that you're working on, does it come to you as a full-blown thing, or do you discover a small part and build on it from there, or how does the whole process work? It's both. It's, uh, sometimes I, I see the entire thing, and sometimes it's been vulnerable enough to trust the moment. Mm -hmm. 
to just go and know that the moment will guide you, music will guide you. That's a very sensitive, very vulnerable moment to be in to where you just know you're on the right path and if you keep going, you're gonna end up at the right place. Mm -hmm. So sometimes those paths are really fun, but also when you're creating and then you just see the whole picture and having the tools around you to be able to accomplish what you need to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So it's fun. It works all kind of ways, just depending on what situation you're in. Right. But it's just really been prepared to do both. Mm -hmm. So you've done uh, production for albums, uh, for, uh, for artists, uh, and you've also done film uh, music, and you're working on Empire and Star mm -hmm. and TV productions mm -hmm. as well. Do each of those differ, or do you approach them in the same way? Um, it's the same way. It's all music. It's been able to... Again, going back to when I was a little boy in church, mm -hmm. is having the ability to hear. You know, melodies are ancient. They've been around since the beginning of time. And I believe if we're vulnerable to it, and if we're very honest, and we allow the music to come in, what I tell my friends and I, what I remind myself is, all you have to do is keep your instrument sharp. Mm -hmm. Because if you keep it sharp, the notes will choose you. And when the notes choose you, just be always available to play and release it. So when I get cues or when people send me, you know, ideas or briefs of what they want to do, I just allow myself to be a really great listener. Mm -hmm. And then through the years, you know, by you sharpening your tools and understanding intellect, you know, intellect and instinct are two valuable things. Intellect will show you, intellect will tell you to pick up the ball. Mm -hmm. Instinct will tell you when to shoot the ball. So it's through the years been able to really develop both of those. And instinct is trusting that invisible place. Right. So you mentioned that uh, artists will send you a brief or, or someone will send you a brief and then you work on it from there. When you hear something like that, how does the process work of knowing what works? You, you mentioned keeping your instrument sharp and being open, but is there a process that you say, this is gonna take this kind of a sound or this kind of a beat or whatever it's gonna be? Hold my hand. How does this feel? It feels like we're shaking hands. How, firm, did, firm how, how does this feel? Uh, different, right? There's a different, different so, relationship there. So knowing what feels right mm -hmm. and then trusting experience. You know, when you have really different mentors, like Michael Jackson was my mentor, Dr. Dre, Babyface, you know, I've been able to sit with Michael and Barry Gibbs from the BGs and the other really amazing mentors I had in my life. And you just learn throughout the years and then something that you bring to the table is you, mm -hmm. which is originality. But you learn and you start to understand this feels right. Mm -hmm. And you start defining and perfecting that to where if it makes you feel a certain way inside, then you're headed down the right direction. If I'm playing, if I'm scoring you right now, if I have a piano, and if I hit a chord that doesn't match your emotion, I'm going to see you change. Mm -hmm. And when I feel that, I know I need to get back, keep that. I need to stay connected. So that's how I kind of, with making music, I try my best to stay connected and stay emotionally attached to the brief, the person, the sound, and stay focused on the finish line. Right. Right. So there's not so much a craft then to what you're doing. You're not approaching it. It is, okay, I've got the G7 and that's the five of the C and I need to go here. You're more looking at the way the whole progression is going to feel in the end. That's the intellect. Okay. You know, I think it's very important to know your notes, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not even re really necessarily knowing how to read, but it's just knowing your way around your instrument, whether it's your voice, whether it's a guitar, a keyboard, or it's just knowing how to get around with your eyes closed, you know, so if I feel like the vocal she or he sounds better and be flat, I know like it's been an amazing instance, instance to where the vocalist may think it's too high for them, but sometimes I know it makes them reach for an emotion that provokes the lyric or song. Right. So it's been able to detail an emotion, but like get, get maximize the moment with an amazing emotion with sound. Right. Yeah, I sound like a, I mean, I sound like an alien, right? No, Musician, not at right? all. No, I, I think that's awesome. We that's so sensitive, y'all. We be so <laughs> sensitive. <you know. laughs> that's the art side of it, though, right? Yeah, that, you, that, you that have that to have it. Artistic side of it, right? Right. That's awesome.
So I mentioned that you're here on behalf of Apogee. Yes. And you guys have quite a project going in Studio A here at Sweetwater. Oh, Can yeah. You tell us a little bit about what's happening. So um, they said we were coming down here, and um, I was really excited because I, I feel like I already know you guys. Yeah. You know, I've bought things from Sweetwater, and it's the first time to where, you know, the people you deal with on the phone, they call you and follow up with you and they sing you candy and i'm like man what kind of <laughs> relationship is this this is different so i kind of i love the vision and mm -hmm. i like how it has been treated and it makes it make getting equipment even more special nice so i feel like i'm meeting i was phone dating with you all all of this time right. so now i get to meet you all in person right right Very and cool. so coming down here we want to do something really special and we wanted to basically write a theme song about Sweetwater and how y'all made us feel. Okay. So what we're doing is we're writing an original song, and I'm I'm doing it with some really amazing people, and um, it's fun. And we also have some of you guys and ladies involved in making the song too. So we're kind of mixing it all up, and um, it's it's fun. Right. Yeah. That's doing awesome. something different. Yeah. So you're tracking it in Studio A, and uh, if I understand correctly, you have a couple of symphony systems with the new Dante card oh, yeah. that are all tied into Sweetwater's yep. Pro Tools rig, and uh, using the mic preamps in the uh, the mic preamp cards yeah. in the symphonies as well. Do you like those preamps? Is that something that you would use as a go-to preamp for your tracks? I have it. Nice. So is you know I stand behind. That I answers the question. Yeah, right? I believe in things. You know, I love things that I believe. You see, I'm mixing all of these words up. That's kind of flavor. If I keep saying it, it's all going to eventually come together. <laughs> anyway, but uh, yeah, we just wanted to showcase how we feel an original song using Apple G gear because mm -hmm. I think it's it's, an am it's amazing stuff. I've been using it for years. Nice, nice. And you're also involved with the latest generation of the USB mic, the the hype mic. Oh yeah. Tell us that story. I saw the video where you did the whole song using the one microphone. Um, it was amazing. Uh, I got this amazing idea maybe like two years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I remember calling Mom um, Betty on the phone for July. And I was like, hey, this amazing idea has just dropped from the heavens above. I was, and because of the kind of different sessions that I'm in with artists from today, from artists that are legends from yesterday, we move a little differently now. And it's one of those moments to where you know how you capture a moment, but the quality isn't as good as you want it to be. Mm -hmm. So you got to try to relive doing that moment all over. So I said, Betty, wouldn't it be amazing to have the first of its kind, never been done before, USB mic that has a built-in analog adjustable compressor. So you get to get your cake and your pie too. Mm -hmm. And she was like, yeah. <laughs> so next thing you know, two years later, she built it. She was a genius. I was like, you built it. Oh, oh my gosh. And and now it has literally revolutionized the way I capture vocals, the way I capture sound. Now, you remember you remember those light pops that had, you know, the candy and they had the gum inside? Sure. It's like now I get to get that in a piece of gear. Nice. This is an amazing built mic. It's like a million dollar sound that can fit in your pocket. And you get your candy and you get your gum at the same time. And right. um, now is, I take it everywhere, and I can capture amazing high-end vocals from anywhere. Final vocals. from You can use it podcasting. You can use it doing different interviews. You know, you can do it, I've used, as you've seen me, mic and live drums, mm -hmm. piano. So it's just nice, you know, and I'm, I'm excited about it. And That's really great. That's awesome mm -hmm. too. And it's so cool that it comes from your idea and you're able to uh, to put it to work. I mean, not all of us have the chance to to really say, hey, let's do this and have it mm -hmm. come out uh, have it come out and be a great piece of gear. So yeah, congratulations I'm super, yeah, I'm super grateful. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Have you seen it yet? I have not used it yet. I've seen it. Mm, it looks so good, huh? I'm, I'm interested to plug it in. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's going to be great. Right. So my last question. No! <laughs> no, I'm not the last question. No, I don't want to be done! No! <laughs> well, let's keep going, just, we'll keep okay. going then. We'll keep going then. So I got more to talk about. Okay. No, my, what I wanted to ask you is, uh, when I have an artist like yourself who operates at a very high level and has had such success, Grammy Awards and, and more, and you work with an array of incredible artists, as you mentioned, legends and new artists and things, what is it that makes a great artist? Being honest. Mm -hmm. Being okay with not knowing all the answers. Is people ask me, I'm looking for that new sound. What's the new sound? What's the new sound? And I tell them that new sound is freedom. Because if you can be yourself, there's nobody like you on this whole entire planet. Mm -hmm. You are a, an original. So if you accept yourself, and if you love 
the masterpiece that you are and you perfect yourself, you know, then you would be your own newest, the world has never heard before you. Because mm -hmm. there's no copy of you. And so that new sound is freedom. That new sound is loving who you are, being okay with where you're at and going from there. Right. So that's, that's, that's my go-to. Right, right, that's very inspiring. I, I, just to dig a little bit deeper there. Let's go. You said perfect yourself. Does that mean musically? Does that mean as an artist? Does that mean in other ways? It means everything, everything that you said, but it starts from within inside. Mm -hmm. Our music is only an expression of where we're at with our life. We can, express, we can either express ourselves the way other people view us, or we can express ourselves the way that we view ourselves. And it's really special when people learn to express themselves from what, how they feel about them. Be okay with being where you're at, because where you're at is where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And when you're master that, you will, you will be introduced to like new levels of your life. So it's like being content with where you're at. And musically, you will sound like that. You know, and um, I remember looking back and remember learning how to play my first chords. And I loved it. And when I got gifted with new chords, I loved that. And when I learned those, it's like the universe opened up and gave me more gifts. And I loved that. So it's like, be grateful for what you have. Mm -hmm. Live your life to your fullest. Don't apologize for being you. Don't apologize for not knowing. You know, and um, love hard, forgive quickly. Because I believe we're like, we're instruments. So when our instruments are clean, those sounds from heaven can just come through us like lightning rods. And there's no distraction and we can just strike. So it's like my philosophy is just it starts from within. Your music will always be a reflection because it comes from an invisible place. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and when your invisible place is, is nurtured and tuned, you know, I believe like the universe is like this, it's like in heaven is like this. And it's like, and if we're like this, it's like we're not connecting, but if we tune, next thing you know, we have this portal that we can go in and out of because we're in tune. And that's when the world starts to recognize, I feel that way because you're connected. And people love, people love it when they see somebody that's confident in being themselves. Right, right. Yeah. The challenge, though, with that, and I've, I've talked to several other artists about this, and I'm, I'm curious to get your take on it, is that uh, your ego has to fit into all that somehow. You've got to either let your ego go so all that can come in. You've got to let the fear of failure go. Where do you stand on all that? How does that factor in? Um, define ego. Well, we all want to be great. We all want to make great music. We all want to be liked for what we do. We all want to be accepted, those kind of things. And so opening yourself to, uh, to uh, not being afraid to put yourself out there, to possibly being not liked, or possibly not being a success in that level, can be a challenge for artists. It's something that many artists struggle with. Um, well, I think it's two few, few things. I think it's great when you want to be great. Um, I've gotten asked, well, I asked myself the question, what is the perfect equation for growth? It's being uncomfortable and happy at the same time. And when it comes to your gift and your talent and just you as a person, you're a masterpiece, you know? Am I, am I living to get gratification from people? Are they my source? Are, is, is, does it end with them? Or am I getting my satisfaction from a higher source that I call love? Mm -hmm. And if love is my go-to, I don't let my talent or my emotions or the way I feel be dictated by a human. Does that make sense? Sure. So when people share their gifts, it's like I'm sharing my gift not to get approved by you. I'm sharing my gift because it's a gift. I don't need thank yous is nice, but I'm giving it to you because I want to give it to you and how you respond doesn't dictate the way I feel about my gift. So it's just knowing that, love me for where I'm at, because I'm gonna keep growing, right. but this is just where I'm at right now. 
and I'm excited to, to have a chance. As like even today, it's a privilege to come to work. It's a privilege to go to the studio. It's a privilege to be able to hear. It's a privilege to be able to score an emotion. It's a privilege to be able to cry. Mm -hmm. It's a privilege to be able to be sensitive. It's a privilege to be able to love and meet people and enjoy them. The beauty in meeting a stranger. You know, what does that sound like? You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Right. So I would tell people, don't apologize for being where you're at. Rejection comes because that's their opinion of what they think you are. But heart can take you places that talent can go. And that's where the famous saying, menial call and but few are chosen. Mm -hmm. And to define that to me is people, def they, they rely on a talent, but they don't have the heart. And then they be, and it's the heart that gets you past the, I don't understand you. It's the heart that gets you past rejection. It's the heart that gets you past, I don't like you. It's the heart that gets you past, I don't agree with you. Your heart tells you to keep going, keep going, keep going. And the people who just rely on the talent stop there. But your heart just, it pushes you and pushes you. And I'm a big fan of wisdom. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, knowledge and wisdom is two different things. Knowledge is knowledge. But I believe wisdom shows you how to apply the knowledge that you have to get results. And then having the understanding to know how to do it again. Right. So with people, I would say it goes back to, again, loving who you are. You're amazing. You're beautiful. We're not perfect. But understanding that we have the chance to keep going every day. We have that gift of choice. Right. So that's where I'm at with music and life. Life, music is life. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing all that wisdom with us. Those really are wise words. And I'm, mm. I'm inspired. I'm going to go play guitar now. Yeah! <laughs> 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 so it's a successful interview. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. And uh, glad to have you here. I'm going to stop by tomorrow and check out the song and hear what you got going on for the, Winning. Theme, the theme to Sweetwater, right? Winning. The theme to Sweetwater. Right on. Right on. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank Great you. to see you. Thank you for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Mitch Gallagher.